So on Socialist News and Views, we let folks introduce themselves. Do you want to just both let listeners know who you are and viewers? Sure. My name is Bill Stodden. I am running for president of the Socialist Party USA. I've been a member of the Socialist Party off and on for the last uh, 20, almost 24 years, uh, more than 24 years, uh, 25 years almost. Oh, hard to believe. I first got involved with uh, Dave McReynolds when he was running for president back in 2000. Um, that's when I joined the party. We, uh, Me and some good comrades were instrumental in founding the Socialist Party of South Dakota around that time, believe it or not. And uh, uh, during the war and everything, we were basically the anti-war movement in the Northern Black Hills. We call ourselves Citizens for Peace, but that's because calling yourself a socialist at that time was basically like saying you supported bin Laden. Uh, so rest in peace, Toby Keith. <laughs> Over. Hi, my name is Stephanie Shlinsky. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am running as the vice presidential candidate of the Socialist Party USA um, in 2024. I have served as the co-chair, I think longer than anyone in modern history, at least. Um, I've also been on the national committee of the Socialist Party for well over a decade. Um, I, I joined back in 2001. I came up in um, the Young People's Socialist League, which is the youth affiliate of the Socialist Party. And I've served on the Women's Commission. I've worked on... Um, every uh, presidential campaign and several local campaigns. Um, I founded several locals. Um, recently, I, I founded a local here in Minnesota and we actually have been able to get three Socialist Party members elected to office in the last three elections here in Minneapolis. Nice. Well, yeah, now you, so you mentioned the, you're running for president and vice president uh, this election with Socialist Party. Um, I feel like there, I don't know if there's more uh, third party campaigns or maybe they're just getting uh, more attention. Um, you know, but a bunch of these part, these uh, campaigns are at least nominally independent of the Democratic and Republican Party. And then there's, I don't know, there's other middle ground people that may be coming in to muddy the waters as well. Um, RFK Jr. is even getting coverage still from left uh outlets for some reason even though he's like a rabid zionist among many other uh significant critiques but as far as actual left uh campaigns um there's cornell west jill stein claudia de la cruz and karina garcia of the party of socialism and liberation and there's some others um and at the moment i'm uh currently uh planning to gather signatures for cornell west's campaign um i've been working with some folks on that um to get him on the ballot in minnesota um you know i I guess I see him as the strongest uh, left challenge at this at this point, but I'm willing to, you know, kind of maneuver depending on, you know, how things go towards the end of this year so that we can get the strongest um, uh, challenge to the capitalist parties. Um, you know, what do you say to other folks that are interested in challenging the duopoly? Maybe they're interested in one of the campaigns that I mentioned uh, before. Um, you know, maybe they they're taking a different approach. What what do you say uh, to get them to put their support behind the Socialist Party USA campaign? Well, I think that probably the strongest argument for the Socialist Party's campaign uh, specifically is that we are a multi-tendency socialist party. Um, I don't know that Cornell West is actually actively critiquing the system of capitalism, uh, and with it, it's related various uh, social illnesses like racism, sexism, uh, hypermilitarism, you know, uh, mass incarceration, all this uh, basically everything that comes along with capitalism that you see, uh, we're actually asking people to consider the possibility of reorganizing the entire economy to promote economic justice for workers. Uh, and this is one of the, the things the Socialist Party is doing. We're not going to uh, win the election this year. We're not going to get the majority of, uh, of Electoral College votes. And I believe, in all fairness to the other campaigns, I believe the Socialist Party is going to get exactly as many Electoral College votes in the fall as Cornell West will. Uh, and so when you say what's the strongest left wing challenge to the duopoly, I believe that we're going to finish exactly where Cornell West finishes, with, you know, which is zero. The Socialist Party, uh, we have uh, the advantage that Cornell West or you know Jill Stein, where she remains unaffiliated, she's going for the green one, but... Uh, we have an advantage of having a long history for a party, and we actually have a solid critique of capitalism within the Socialist Party that 
Cornell West, Jill Stein, and to some degree, um, you know, Comrade uh, De La Cruz uh, doesn't necessarily have in that we're a solidly working class uh, campaign. Stephanie and I both work 40 hour a week jobs. Uh, so we're of the working class. I don't know uh, how these other campaigns decide that they're able to go out and campaign full time, but they certainly don't work regular jobs like, you know, like maybe you and, and certainly us uh, work. Uh, in that sense, we are capable of speaking uh, from the working class as opposed to just to the working class. Cornell West is an elite academic. Jill Stein is a medical doctor. Claudia Dela Cruz, uh, I'm not really sure about her biography, but she's her. She's with a party that has a lot of money, and they can make very slick advertisements. Uh, you know, when, when I talk about the poor, that's because uh, I'm about a paycheck away from being dirt poor myself. You know, I work in a charity where I help people uh, make their rent payments every single month. But it wasn't that long ago when I would apply for that same charity to help make my own rent payment. And so I think that for a lot of people, they're running uh, for president as sort of a uh, an academic exercise, whereas I'm running for president, you know, because we need to build a movement that can actually uh, – that can actually counter capitalism, that can uh, address homelessness, that can address food insecurity, that can address the issues that working class people in this country face. And I think that uh, Stephanie and myself and the Socialist Party itself um, can actually do a, a pretty good job of that. We we have a great set of principles. We have a great platform that, that talks about working class issues. And I think from the working class itself, uh, you know, that that said, I don't want to take anything away from those other campaigns, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a movement for socialism. Uh, it's not we're not going to win the election this year. But if we bring attention to socialism, if we move the Green Party left, for example, or if we get the, the PSL out there and they're really talking about socialism, they're really talking about workers, democracy and, and the workers actually taking the means of control over and people actually taking control of their lives. We're actually talking about socialism. Then socialism wins. The Socialist Party will get members when we're running our campaign and we might not get uh, one single electoral college vote this time, but maybe next time we might have more uh, more more members and so we're not starting at zero next time. So that's what we're out here about. We're out here to build a movement for socialism. We're out here to talk about workers' democracy. We're out here to talk about the diff various different ways we can accomplish that in society. And we're out here actually posing a very solid uh, critique of capitalism from a working class perspective, because I believe that we are, represent that. And I would say that that's probably our biggest benefit. Over. Um, I, I would uh, just to add on that. Um, I don't view us as in competition with other third parties. In fact, the last election we ran, we ran in tandem with um, the Green Party. Uh, Howie Hawkins ran, and he has been a Socialist Party member for many, many years, longer than me. Um, and I don't think our our goal is to to say we're better or worse than them. Um, we do have a very unique role to, to fill as far as our platform and our history. Um, the Socialist Party USA, um, as many people know, formed from the Debs Caucus of the Socialist Party of America, which was the far left um, uh, part of the party. Uh, and one of the main uh, points of contention was if socialists should work within the Democratic Party, parties that support capitalism and try to um, you know, this is the time of the new left. Try to try to um, basically push them to the left, and and we said no. We we are not going to work within socialist parties. That is not our strategy. Um, you, you know, I don't think it's been a very effective strategy. Although we we obviously um, the the left in the U.S. is not in good shape. Um, but as far as a strategy of trying to make the Democrats a socialist party, that definitely has not been um, fruitful. Uh, and, and we are a multi-tendency working class party and, you know, the working class itself is multi-tendency. Um, and, and that's one reason the Socialist Party, especially to me, is very important because I don't, um, I, I consider myself an anarcho-communist. I don't really fit well within um, some of the, the Marxist parties or, um, so we, we don't have a, a very strict party line like other um uh, more top-down parties might. We're, we're more local-based. Our leadership doesn't have a lot of power. Um, the power lies in the members. Um, I mean, everything about what we do is is democratic grassroots. That's that's um, our lifeblood. Um, 
so that that's one thing that distinguishes us. Um, I, I I really would like to build more um, cooperation with other parties on the far left, but we are of course doing this campaign um, primarily to spread class consciousness because we are uh, we believe in we're not reformists. We we are revolutionary. We know that the changes we seek are not going to be brought about through voting because the owning class would never allow that. Our goal is to spread class consciousness. And there is a dire need for that. And um, electoral uh, campaigns like this, especially the presidential one, has it's always been one of the most effective ways um, both to spread our message, to find um, people that we normally wouldn't reach, and, um, and to build the party. It, it, it is effective. Um, right. And uh, yeah, so that's... Um, I, I think we have a, a great platform and the campaign itself um, speaks for itself. So if anyone's curious, um, either check out the Socialist Party USA or Stodd and Shalinsky 2024. Yeah, I think you guys, I think you guys covered this a little bit, but uh, I, I was thinking the other day, um, you know, kind of like thinking like I should make a little list of like reasons why socialists might run for political office, um, specifically thinking in bourgeois elections and specifically the presidential uh, election. Um, and I thought it would just be like a couple of reasons, but then, then I kept thinking of new reasons. Um, and I think I ended up with like eight or nine distinct, you know, well, depending on how you figured out kind of distinct reasons of why you, why you might do that from, you know, pressuring other parties into concessions, um, you know, all the way to again, yeah, yeah. Propagandizing and finding a way to get your message out to people that you wouldn't, you know, ordinarily reach, um, you know, what do you think are the uh, the the reasons you two decided to run this campaign? And then you mentioned this a little bit too. What do you say to people that say that socialists could better use their time on campaigns and strategies uh, that aren't uh, based around electoralism um, and participating in the elections that you could be out doing other uh, work and that would be a better use of your time? You have thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, the first thing is, you know, we can go back to, I'm not a very good person to quote Karl Marx. I I, I know that much Karl Marx. Uh, like Stephanie, I, I come from a little bit more uh, you know, anarcho-communist tradition. I don't know, like anarcho Bill is very knowledgeable. He's, he's just very humble. I mean, <laughs> he, he's a Karl PhD. He, is, he has expertise in um, Latin America, foreign policy in Latin America. He, he, he is very knowledgeable. Yes. Well, Thank you for thank you, Stephanie. Uh, um, but I I would say that Karl Marx said that the uh, the working class should utilize whatever tools they have at their disposal, and in this case, uh, in 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 one of the tools at our disposal is the elections. Uh, we can participate in the elections, so why not? I mean, we're a political party. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not we're not the DSA. The DSA is a pressure group within the uh, democratic party for the most part they they they're the people that stephanie was talking about that dreamed in 1973 of entering the democratic party to pull them to the left i don't like to use term i don't like to use the term pushing them to the left because that suggests that they're on their right and they're yeah. kind of pushing them the dsa isn't on the right of the democratic party the dsa is the left wing of the democratic party and their whole goal you know if, if you talk about bernie sanders or aoc or any of these other individuals who identify with the DSA, their whole goal was to be within the Democratic Party and to pull the Democratic Party to the left. And as Stephanie correctly mentioned, we see how good that's done. It's it's not done very good. So the Socialist Party itself stands apart from that system as our own party. And we got this a lot. Maybe you have a question later on about this, but uh, we get a lot of people asking us, why are you guys running uh, a party independent from, like, say, the Green Party, for example? Why don't you just cancel your campaign and go and help the green party get their 5% so they can get matching funds. And then the, the left will win. And the idea is, you know, the reason I'm not, the reason I'm running for president and not running from the green party is I don't have anything against the greens. I just am not a green. I'm not, I don't agree with that platform. I agree with the socialist party's platform. We have an independent political organization. So that's why we run campaigns. Uh, we had this discussion within our convention about whether or not we should run a campaign or utilize those resources in a different way. And I think, you know, the the, the thing is, is that we need to, just like we're in a multi-tendency party, we should also be a multi-tactic party. We should utilize every single tactic that's available 
to us to build socialism. And if it, it's, it, we can raise money. I mean, the Socialist Party can raise money. The, the the campaign can raise money. We've already raised a little bit of money, you know, and we make all of our donors public, unlike some other campaigns. We, we make all of our donors public. We report them out. We've itemized them out to the FEC in our first report already. And we tell people who we get our money from because we believe that this is a people or oriented and people led movement. It's not us who's putting all the money behind it. We're not getting secret dark money from some uh, you know, tech billionaire or something like that. We're getting all of our money from the people who believe in this campaign and support this campaign. And why shouldn't we utilize those resources to run for president? We won't we won't win in the electoral college votes, but we can utilize those resources then to get out and tell people this is what this is what class warfare is and guess what you're in class warfare you may not know it but you're being you're having con- class warfare conducted against you so you may as well join it you may right. as well fight back and i think that that's one of the one of the things that electoral campaigns can do we can show people that look there are people that will stand up for these ideas there are people that will put time and effort and money and resources behind these ideas and there will people there are people who will fight for them so if you might be on the fence out there wondering if you should get involved well you can see other people are getting involved so why not why not donate a little time to to volunteer or run that vote donate $25 here or $50 here to help get this message out to people because if you really believe that message you got to put some skin in the game too and that's just how it is uh so I'm taking my time. I'm donating my time. And also, uh, I, I spend $25 a month. I donate $25 a month to my own campaign because I believe in it. You know, and Stephanie's donating her time. All of the people on our, our campaign are donating their time and their, their money and that kind of stuff. And we're all working together because that's the kind of thing we need to do to get that message out about socialism. And as Stephanie will, will say, to spread class consciousness and, and, and the facts about class warfare. I would say that the main thing, um, wh- why it's important to run a campaign and work in electoral politics rather than um, focusing elsewhere is because one of the things that the owning classes rely on is keeping Americans ignorant of the fact that there is an alternative to capitalism. Um, if we are not in this arena and pushing different policies, most people are not going to hear about them. Most people are going to think that the only options they have are, you know, fascists or people who tend to capitulate with fascists and will always side with fascists if um, the other option is communist, which is definitely. Um, and sorry, my <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> that that kind of that kind of shocked me. I don't know why that happened. <laughs> um, my lighting is weird because my ring light broke, and I I'm trying to like cobble together something so you can see me. Um, we're just talking about the fascists and then the lights went out I know. Like, oh, what's going yeah. on they're they're, they're, yeah. they're after us here so, <laughs> so it, it is important that um we put that um th- those different policies out there and um an- another way we might differ from like social democrats or even people like bernie sanders like personally i don't think the dsa is the left wing of the democratic party i think they aspire to be but i don't think they're there yet but um, you know that that's one reason we wouldn't support them because we don't we do not want to reform capitalism. We want uh, we want to build a new system from the ground up. And what we do not support is uh, like socialism is not when the government does stuff. Socialism is not a capitalist welfare state like Sweden or Norway. That is not socialism. That is a capitalist welfare state. What we support is socialism, which is when the workers own and control the means of production. And our end goal, of course, is. Uh, communism, a classless, stateless society. Um, we, we don't want to make things just better for people in wealthy countries, because when you, um, like, even if we were to succeed and get uh, a welfare state, we were to make those reforms, and we would be more like um, some of the Scandinavian countries, those countries are able to offer such a generous welfare state because of the exploitation of the global South. We want class, we are internationalists, we want class consciousness and socialism globally, not just, we're not just worried about the U.S. I mean, obviously the U.S. does enough intervening in other countries, we're not saying that, you know, we want more of that. Uh, I don't think that would mm-hmm. be in our, our interests, um, but, um, you know, we, we aren't just for the working class here in the U.S., um, we are, we were in we are in solidarity with all working class people, and we need to put those policies out there and to critique the U.S.'s foreign policy as well. 
Um, and, and if we're not doing it, and it, it doesn't have to be the Socialist Party, but if socialists as, as a group are not doing that, no one is going to be hearing that message. And that's why it is important to work within electoral politics, even if you, um, you know, we, we know we have no corporate funding, we're all volunteers. Um, I, I think we would probably win the award for the poorest campaign, <laughs> it's, it's like our members and um, yeah. we're, we're all working class. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know that obviously, but um, we, the Socialist Party <laughs> does not have, we have one staff member, um, right. we're all, yeah, we, we are definitely working class, um, but we, we need to put those alternatives out there. It's it's very important. I think that's one of the only ways we're going to build class consciousness, especially now when voters are so uh, disillusioned. And that is right. why they're disillusioned, because there there are no answers. We have this culture war where they're talking about different things and people take their sides, but no one's really addressing the actual problems that people are facing every day. And right. we can do that. Yeah, and speaking of uh, foreign policy, once uh, all these Scandinavian countries join NATO, they won't even have that money for those welfare states anymore, even with even with their exploitation, because they'll have all those weapons that they need to uh, to throw in money for. Um, you know, as as far as uh, platform of the campaign, um, you know, you've talked about some of that stuff, but if you were to focus in on a few topics, you know, say three or four issues or campaign campaign planks that you think are you you know going to correct connect most directly with uh working class voters in this year 2024 think of it as kind of you know what you put on a sign or you know what you put on a table that kind of stuff what kinds of what kinds of things what kind of mottos or or or, or issues or campaign uh you know slogans that kind of thing are there, are there things that you guys are um uh thinking about that you think are are, are really on the minds of working class people well i think peace is one of them Peace is really big with regard not only to working class, but also with young people, I think like college age and uh, and 20 something. Uh, obviously, I'm a Gen Xer. I'm a young Xer, but I'm still a Gen Xer. But we're talking with uh, Gen Z. I got two Gen Z kids. Uh, my my uh, my son, my kids are both teenagers. And I'm thinking about what kind of world they're going to have to go into. And if you got a world that's completely riven by like two war new forever wars you know i mean we just got out of the just got out of the one that lasted 20 years that existed since they were born and like it wasn't like six months before we were back in another one like these people especially like biden for example never he's never met a war that he doesn't want to join i mean i i can't think of a single one that he hasn't been like on the gung-ho for you know and so he's now calling for us to continue to put endless resources, endless money, endless time into Ukraine. And he's now interested, just itching to start another war with Iran over this business in, in Palestine, the, the, uh, the genocide in Palestine, the peace, you know, the, the, the people there are, are, are trying to live in peace and, and Israel just decides that they're going to go bomb the whole country uh, and, and continue their genocidal apartheid business going on there. So we're expanding that now to Yemen. We're expanding that to Jordan. We're expanding that, uh, you know, making plans up to invade and, and, and to bomb Iran. Like, I, I don't understand what it is about this government and their addiction to war, but it must have something to do with money because if you got 70 to 80 to 90% of the people in this country opposing the war in Palestine and calling for a ceasefire, like an un- like a like a like a no conditions an unconditional ceasefire right now so we can sort this out and figure it out in a peaceful uh, peaceful you know milieu rather than during a war and the government just continues to say no we're not going to do that we're not going to pressure them to do a ceasefire we're going to continue to fund them or try to fund them we're going to continue to put money into completely unrelated bills uh you know so that we can continue to fund that genocide over there uh, I, I, you know, people have a real problem with that. And it's really offensive to Americans that our government is doing that in our name, not to mention barbaric uh, that we're that we're supporting that action over there. I think that's probably the, the biggest thing we've come across this spring that's required the, uh, the most attention. I would say, you know, other not less important, but slightly down on our, our radar, of course, is jobs uh, and the price of the cost of living. We talk about rent. We talk about the price of food and we talk about how how inflation has cut into any gains that the workers made as a result of the narrow job market and during pandemic. Uh, they got a, you know a, a, some anywhere between a five to seven percent raise, but we've been having inflation now that's come across that that mean that the prices go up by 21 percent. So workers are now poorer 
even though there's more people in the, on the job force and the news constantly talks about these great job numbers that the Biden administration has been able to put up. First of all, he hasn't done anything. It's not him that's doing that. Second of all, uh, you know, we still haven't gotten inflation under control. We talk about three, four, five percent on infla inflation, but that's not deflation. That's not the same thing as prices going down. That just means they're going up slower. So we're still seeing prices going up. And with these you know, new wars, we're expecting gas prices to go up now. We're, then that's going to mean higher prices in food. That's going to mean higher prices for everything. So jobs and inflation, the cost of living is another thing. Plus, you know, we want to talk about things like health care, of course. These are things that are on people's minds because when you have people uh, refusing to go to the hospital to deal with broken bones because they know that it's going to be a four-year four $50,000 hospital bill while they get their bones set, it keeps people from even living a decent life and working, you know, even a job because now they have a broken leg or some disease that they they could have gotten cured had they been able to 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 uh, obtain, you know, reasonable cost healthcare or you know as I would prefer nationalized healthcare, uh, because they can't get any access to healthcare because it's going to bankrupt their families and you know maybe put them out on the streets maybe cause their kids to not to go without meals certainly not allow them to save any money. Uh, these, these, for me, these are the three biggest things we can think of a whole list of things. I think student loans is another problem that we have in this country. Um, uh, massive credit card debt, environmental destruction. I mean, for crying out loud, you, we were talking right before the show, just in a, a couple minutes about how you mentioned that Chile is experiencing wildfires. That's that's killed hundred people already. This summer is going to be brutal in California. Mm -hmm. We're going to yeah. see that again over and over and over again. We're going to see wildfires, massive storms, you know, living in Iowa here. I'm seeing my insurance premiums uh, in this state go up by 25% because of climate caused natural disasters like derechos. Mm -hmm. We had two massive derechos that wiped out all these farms in this area. And not to say anything against the people of Iowa, because the people of Iowa are good salt of the earth type people or whatever. But these are the same idiots that vote for Chuck Grassley and Donald Trump. And then they wonder why their crops are being destroyed and their farms are being destroyed because they have been convinced that the Republican Party is going to offer them the solutions that they're looking for. When as a matter of fact, those people don't care about the farmers any further than they can throw them. And there's evidence that they don't care about the farmers. They're promoting all these climate destroying uh, economic uh, systems like oil drilling and fracking and every other damn thing that's putting all these pollutants into the atmosphere. And this is one thing I actually mentioned before. I'll, I'll, I'll stop, uh, I'll get off my, my soapbox here, but why is it that 1,000 people are being are being asked to use paper straws when one billionaire can just fly their private jet around and just negate everything they do? You know, I've been recycling for years, you know, all this, I've been not getting plastic bags or whatever, everything that I've been asked to do. And a, a billionaire can just negate all my hard work and all my, all the, the hard work of my 1000 neighbors and no one's, nothing's being done about that guy. No one's asking him to give up his private jet. They're asking me to give up things and yeah, we should get rid of plastic bags, but I expect that the people who are actually polluting the environment are billionaires, our corporations. I mean, maybe Stephanie has the figures on this. It's something like, the billionaire class contributes something like 40% of the, all the, the environmental destroying pollutions, uh, pollu pollutants in the world. The, the billionaires and the corporations uh, provide all this stuff. We're not asking any of them to sacrifice. And I think that that's, you know, there's there's a couple reasons for that because we're at actually putting a systemic problem like environmental destruction on individuals and asking individuals to solve it. I mean, that's completely inappropriate. We need systemic solutions to systemic problems. Uh, but another thing is, of course, the billionaires are the ones that write the rules. And so they write themselves out of any kind of um, burden sharing. So I think those are my my big ones. Peace, you know, the cost of living and healthcare would be my big one. And also the environment, I guess, is big four. I think the stat you're referring to is that um, 71 or sorry, 100 companies are responsible for 71 percent of emissions. That's uh, it. I would say capitalism is responsible for almost all of climate change, because if we were to run our um, our economy in a sustainable and democratic way, um, we, we wouldn't have went down this road. There's just no reason for it. Um, as, as far as issues, um, I would say uh, peace, climate change, uh, economic democracy, austerity. Um, like I, I pay between what I pay in premiums and what my university pays, uh, I think it's $22,000 a year for my insurance 
premium for me and my husband, which is, I mean, I, I don't, I make slightly over double that. Um, and when you talk about taxes, it, it actually ends up. So when you, you, you have what my university is paying, because I, I work at a university, is paying for my premium every month, plus what I'm paying and what I'm paid. Every two weeks, Medica gets about as much money as I do as a result of me working full time just for my premium, which is just wild if you think that about is, it. That is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, something I wanted to touch on a little bit, uh, you know, we aren't, it, it is, uh, it's hard to turn the TV on when you see how things are going. It seems like we're not making any progress. And, and yes, I, I won't deny that in many ways we are going backwards, especially when it comes to things like um, abortion rights, uh, trans rights. Um, so in 1901, the, social, the Socialist Party of America formed, and this was... Um, the bulk of their platform. These were some of their major demands. Women's suffrage, barring children under 16 from working, free public education for all, this is um, primary education, unemployment and social security benefits, and the creation of a public health department, a labor department, a uh, department for occupational health and safety, and the establishment of a, basically what would be an environmental protection agency. This was their platform in 1901. And it wasn't the Socialist Party itself that achieved all these things. It was the organization of unions and public pressure that forced um, these reforms. But, you know, at the time, I'm sure they were looking at these goals the same way we're looking at, at some of the goals we have. We don't see it as, as possible, but it, it, it really is. And radicals really do write the future. We have these policy solutions. If these problems are ever to be solved, this is how they're going to be solved. And I might not see how exactly that's going to happen, but you know, when you turn on the TV and you see a genocide happening and you feel just it, it just pierces you. Very <laughs> overwhelming. <laughs> Overwhelmed. You feel, like you, you feel like you can't do anything. You feel like, I mean, personally, I feel like I've worked my entire life and things are collapsing, but you can't let that get to you because like, what's the alternative? I'm, I'm not going to give up and fighting for these causes um, is, is what keeps me going. Cause I feel like I, I, and I am making a difference. I mean, we made a difference here in, I mean, I think the new superintendent of Minneapolis public schools just, just started. We're, we're also fighting for um, to make Minnesota a sanctuary state for immigration and immigration. It looks like is, um, going to be a big issue in the campaign. And uh, one, I'm sorry, the, the Democrat and Republican campaign. It should be an issue for us too. Um, one, one thing I wanted to mention that I should have said before is one thing that also defines the Socialist Party is that we are a socialist feminist party. We are an intersectional socialist feminist party, um, which is different than liberal identity politics or the... Um, um, class reductionism of, you know, more reactionary leftists who think that groups like Black Lives Matter or any groups that focus on um, human rights issues of like a specific group are just distracting us from class consciousness. Um, mm -hmm. we, we believe in an uh, intersectional revolution, an intersectional liberation of all peoples. And we, all these things are connected. Um, we are very staunchly feminist and um, I, I don't know how you can be a leftist and not be a feminist, but um, <laughs> some people manage. I don't know how. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's <laughs> but um, but yeah, you, you know, there, there. No matter who you are, if you're listening to this, especially if you're in Minneapolis, because I, I could definitely use your help. Um, you know, we're going to be gathering signatures too to get on the ballot. Um, there are so many things you can work on and so many things you can do to make a difference. And it doesn't have to be in electoral politics. I understand a lot of people don't want to get into it because it's it's kind of a slag, honestly. It's especially if you're a third party, because you know, the Democrats were not happy with us winning elections, even though these are uncontested districts that Republicans aren't gonna win or even mm -hmm. run in. But 
you know, and when we won, they didn't look at us and, and look at our policies and think, huh, you know, this seems to be what people actually want. Maybe we should look into this. No, they, they're going to do everything they can to make sure that we never get on the ballot. We never run again. We never win again, because that's what they care about. They don't care about democracy. They care about ma maintaining power. Um, so, it, I mean, it is, it can be disheartening, but we still have the ability to fight. And as long as we do, I will be there to do it. Yeah, I mean, if we could find, uh, you know, a bunch of people that actually believe in democracy, we could we could get them to sign all of our uh, petitions to get people on the ballot, because that would be like, the you know, the full, no, I'm not joking. I, I think that's um, what we should be doing, that the fullest yeah. democratic uh, rights, um, you know, that, that we should be able to have uh, a lot of different choices on the ballot instead of just, you know, two. Well, I, I'm, I'm not I, saying, I, I think we should work together on this. Can I, we, can I say something about this then? Yeah, let, like, and, and let's think of this as kind of wrapping up too. So just so you know, because we're sure. running low on time here. So go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it quick. I think that there's two different kinds of democracy that we're talking about here. What the socialists are talking about is a substantive form of democracy where we're actually saying the people can substantially impact and affect the course of the government. They can, they can substantially rule. Uh, where their vote actually means something, where they where they vote for things and they see those things reflected in the policy of the government that's elected, or they participate themselves in that in that policy making right. process, as opposed to some formal form of democracy, which Democrats talk about when they say we want democracy, blah blah blah. What they want is for people to cast a meaningless vote that they don't have to listen to, and there's no binding on the people that are elected uh, based on that vote. And once you vote after four years, then you're you're done every four years, and it's kind of like the Stevie Wonder song that talks about how politicians ignore people in the ghetto and and poor people all the time until election time comes around, then the politicians are out knocking on the doors talking about, oh, we care about the poor, we care about the workers, you know, you know, because we have this formal sort of democracy and what we're looking for is a substantive or a substantial form of democracy. Uh, when Stephanie talked about revolution, this is part of what she's saying. We need a fundamental radical change in the structure of our economics and our politics and the relationships we have within our society. I talk about social revolution. It's part of the same process. We need a radical change in the way we do things in this country so that the current system, which is not only, you know, only half-stepping with regard to actual people's power, uh, but also contains a number, like a, a myriad of roadblocks to prevent people from actually getting into power, is changed in such a radical way where people aren't ever denied that ability. And I also, you know, I also got to remember that in our country, if we truly are a 50-50 country, I don't know that we really are. I don't know that that statistic is actually very accurate, but if we truly are a 50-50 country, if we if we just give it give give it for the sake of argument, that means that 50% of the population isn't going to want what we're selling. And so while we get rid of these roadblocks, we also have to empower people to make decisions in such a way where they're willing and able to defend their own interests, whatever those interests happen to be. If those interests are, you know, uh, heaven forbid, knock on wood to line me up in front of a firing squad and shoot me, you know, I mean, I might have to go to Cuba to avoid that. But uh, I mean, if that's what our democracy turns into, but I think that if you actually gave people the power over their own communities, over their own workplaces, over you know the various institutions that get people to divide against one another. And you said, okay, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to do something different. So you all figure out how to run your society and run your economy in a way that benefits you all the most. People are going to pick clean river, clean air over dirty rivers and dirty air. People are going to pick a society that doesn't just incarcerate you know, a whole one percent of our population, and keeps them incarcerated, and keeps them from exercising their basic, you know, civil rights in this country. People are going to pick peace. People are going to pick, you know, uh, controlling, uh, controlling their the places that they work and reaping the benefits rather than handing it over to some, you know, group of 100, 110 billionaires. People are going to pick this. I think if they're actually given real control over their society, and so that's the difference between what we're talking about: substantive form of democracy where people are actually control these things from the bottom up, you know, from the local areas, they control their own economies. You know, it's not this top down model anymore, which is what our current system is based on. You're actually talking about a revolution, like a changing of the regime in this country at the, at the, um, at the end of it, that's what you have to do. You can't just 
continue on with liberal bourgeoisie democracy the way we have it now, we actually have to change that. And so actually getting people to start talking about socialism and start voting for socialism and start organizing in their communities, in their workplaces, in their schools, in their unions, and every other organization they have for socialism is the first step to the, in that process, uh, which at the end of it, you know, becomes people, you know, popular democracy becomes economic democracy, which becomes social equality. And there's, there's all this great stuff that we say we want at the end of the day. We got to take those first few steps first. And, you know, the Marxists out there are probably cheering, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, he's saying like socialism is the transition period. I don't know. I don't know what I don't know what it's going to look like when we do get socialism. I don't know what it's going to lead to, but I'm hoping that the people start deciding things in their own interest and start deciding what's best for them when they have the opportunity to do so. Right now, we don't have that opportunity. Socialism aims at getting people that opportunity to make their own destiny, to make their own future, and to start thinking about what a clean planet can look like and start thinking about what an equal uh, economy can look like, or what a more equitable distribution of resources in the society can look like, including social and political capital where you don't have just a bunch of elite, elites telling you what's up, but I'm actually feeling that the things I'm voting for, I actually get to see in law and that kind of stuff. So that's what socialism, I think, is. It, it points to that substantive form of democracy, that substantive form of people's power, rather than this formal nonsense we have in, in this society. It's like what uh, Stephanie was saying about uh, you know intersectionality and about fighting for people's actual liberation versus, you know, liberal performativity that you know that they're playing they're playing a game and they the game is never intended to give you uh your rights or meet your basic needs it's just you know it's just a game of who can say the right things and who can you know uh who who can keep the uh working people at bay while they you know steal all the money and all that stuff um and then uh one other statistic that i found related to what you guys were talking about before was one of the um the Guardian articles about uh, an analysis, and it was in their uh, the Great Carbon Divide, where they said that uh, twelve billionaires' climate emissions out polluted two point one million homes. Um, so that's just twelve. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's like people. what I was thinking about too. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, it said the richest one percent account for more carbon emissions than the poorest sixty six percent. So there's a lot of there's a lot of numbers like this that that almost sound like unbelievable, but I mean that's how that's how stark the uh, the situation is here. And I think climate is like one of the top issues, but as far as connecting to people, I feel like it's still that issue of like, so, like sometimes it's like people can't take it on. It's just like so overwhelming. And, you know, I think the, the, ge the genocide and the helplessness that people feel around that is, is they want peace. I think peace is a good way to frame that, but they're getting, you know, there's a kind of this overwhelming thing. I think obviously the, the affordability, that's a huge one. That's like every day they're just feeling this, you know, people are feeling this crushing weight. Um, yeah. And it's like people that have insurance and they still can't get any, uh, uh, uh any medical care. Well, I really appreciate that. You know, I really appreciate the chance to hear from you. I will, you know, um, I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on the campaign. Um, I definitely believe we should all be out there trying to, uh, you know, make this a disaster for the two parties of Wall Street, um, you know, leave them in disarray in November. I think there's a lot of opportunity for that more so this year than maybe ever. Um, you know, we need a lot of public discussion among different left wing campaigns, labor movement, other social movements. Um, as we move forward, I think, you know, that could lead to a lot of success. Um, you know, is there anything else that you got either y'all want to share before you go? Um, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, as a Socialist Party member and the Socialist Party in general, we, we don't struggle for um, to find our purpose or relevancy right now. We see the colossal failures of capitalism. We, we see that we need better leadership and a better system. And we do offer real change, a real alternative. Um, and we know that capitalism is not sustainable. We see it dying in front of us. And unfortunately, um, depending on how this um, pans out, it could do a lot of damage um, in the process. Uh, we, we will eventually have to change. So ultimately, the question that we're looking at right now is, is not whether or not capitalism will die. It's whether it will take us with it. And right. that is ultimately um, 
what we have to think about this generation when we make these political choices. Um, I'm going to go the shameless plug route. <laughs> uh, we are at SPUSA 2024 on everything. Uh, SPUSA2024.org is our website. Uh, come check us out there. We have some stuff and we're going to be putting more stuff up as, as uh, the days pass here. Uh, with regard to where we stand, uh, you know, some of our policy posi policy positions, how you can get involved in the campaign. We have volunteer links there. We have donate links if you happen to have some extra, you know, I was going to say skrill, uh, some extra money in your pocket uh, and you want to kick it down to the campaign, we'll be happy to take it and put it to good work. Uh, also, um, it, let your friends know. Don't tell people that it's there. If you happen to be listening to our, to our uh, interview here on Socialist News and Views, Tell everybody you know to check it out. You know, we'll go on YouTube, SPUSA 2024 on YouTube, SPUSA 2024 on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok even. We have a, Twi a TikTok account, believe it or not. Although I am a little bit too old to figure out how to do it. So I got to figure out how to like, uh, how to work that thing. But we are SPUSA 2024 dot uh, everything. And um also, while you're doing that, while you're checking that out, check out the SocialistPartyUSA.net. SocialistPartyUSA.net is the Socialist Party's website. There you can see the party's platform. You can see our principles. And if you happen to read the principles and think, man, that's right on. I really dig that. By all means, join the party. It can't hurt. You will be doing a, a lot of great uh, work. There's probably a local in your area, or if there's not, you can form one. Uh, this is how we get an organization capable of actually addressing capitalism started here. Now we we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, hitting hitting the bottom of the barrel at, after COVID, but I mean, I think everybody is. So we're not any much any further behind, you know, PSL or anything like that uh, with regards to where we're at. And it's all it's all up from here. We're just we're building again. We're we're uh, the whole aim of this campaign is to build the party up. So. SocialistPartyUSA.net is a very important place, has a lot of great information on it, and it will tell you about things that that comrades across the country are doing. Uh, North Carolina, we got uh, Wayne running for governor. Uh, we have William uh, Chichi running down in Arkansas uh, nice. for office for basically it's just as the piece, but it's it's not just as the piece. It's, it's more than that. They just call it just as the piece as his office. Uh, our, our good friend, Josh. Uh, Bradley is running in North Carolina. Uh, I believe he's running for city council. Is that right, Stephanie? Yes, yeah, it is. And we have yeah. other we have other individuals that are looking to to start uh, campaigns under the Socialist Party banner. Stephanie, you can tell about the the uh, school board in in Minneapolis where we have three Socialist Party oh. USA members. Well, I know I know we have to wrap up, but yeah, you you can check it out the website. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for having us. Yeah, I, uh, I really appreciate the time, and uh, thanks for speaking with me. And, uh, yeah, and I will include links to all the, uh, things that you mentioned as well. So thanks. Thank you very much.